um, as we get going. And um, we, uh, if, if you could, in the chat, um, introduce yourself and um, say which part of the world you're from, that would be fantastic. Um, so we can keep a good um, uh, uh, kind of eye on uh, uh, where everyone's um, coming, dining from, in from today. That would be wonderful. Um, so we've got uh, participants jumping up. I, I'll do. I'm Lucy Shame, the Group CEO of Putera. So I'm just I'm just going to do a little bit of filler for a moment while everyone comes in, and then I'll introduce our fantastic panelists. Um, do a little intro um, myself, and then hand over. Ask some questions of Cecilia, and hand over to Asia. Um, Oh, that's great to see all the introductions from everyone. That's fantastic. And um, uh, as well as um, putting your intros of who you are and where you're dialing in from, if you could also um, ask questions of our panelists as we go, and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Okay, so um, I am so delighted to be joined by two brilliant panelists today, uh, both authors and practitioners in their own right. So we have Aja Barber, who's a writer, stylist and consultant. Aja's work deals with the intersections of sustainability in the fashion landscape, and her work builds very heavily on the ideas behind privilege, wealth, inequality, racism, feminism. Azure will tell us all about this um, um, uh, in, a, uh, in a few moments. And Azure is also the author of this which I would, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd just hold it up there for a while longer. You can get it on Azure's website. You can get it on Amazon. You get it on Waterstones. I bought mine from Waterstones in the UK. I think you can get it from Barnes and Nobles in the US. Anyway, there's all the links there on Azure's site. It's a fantastic read. We'll be drilling into some of the ideas in it, um, but there's a lot more in it than this webinar can do justice to. I have to buy it. And then we also have with us today, Cecilia Aranya Parker, who is Director of Consumer Protection Enforcement at the UK's Competition and Markets Authority. And she's the project director for the CMA's investigation into misleading environmental claims. And she's advised on a diverse range of issues from public law, human rights, and the devolution um, to social security and energy. And again, the CMA code or the Green Claims Code that Cecilia will be telling us today is also a fantastic read. So we'll be providing links to everything um, in the chat, uh, but also drilling into some of the most pertinent uh, issues um, of, of, as of today. Okay, so briefly from me, I'm the group CEO of Futera, I'm Lucy Shea, I'm a founder member of the UN Sustainable Lifestyles Working Group, um, I'm on the steering group of the UN uh, of the UNFCCC's Fashion Charter, a trustee of Fashion Revolution, and I've been CEO of Futera since 2009. Thank you, LinkedIn, that we can keep abreast of our own developments. Um, I joined Futera in 2003, and Futera is independent, mission-led to a B Corp, uh, we're majority female-owned and run. We've got about 60 staff in the UK, North and South America. And what we do is sustainability strategies and creative campaigns for the leaders in sustainability, from Formula One to Google, PNG. Now, as you would hope, we were one of the early adopters of um, uh, creating and marketing solutions, but without green. We did uh, a greenwash guide back in 2008. Um, and it's why as an agency we have both logic and magic we found it is the only way as an agency to make sure you don't greenwash to have a team of dedicated experts on sustainability within the agency in fact when we published that guide and did the research for it in 2007 we reached out to all of the kind of the main network agencies and asked them about their position on greenwash and da, 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 they didn't have one. And what that means is you're very likely to be greenwashing by default, because it's actually easier to greenwash than not greenwash from often from over enthusiasm or naivety, assuming that every claim is validated. Um, so we find most of that. 
though there are egregious cases of greenwash um, and perhaps in 2022 our forgiveness levels should not be what they were right today we are going to be looking at fashion as a particular uh, almost case study industry and that's both because as cecilia will tell us it is the first industry that the cma will be reviewing against the green against the green claims code and it's also where Azure, you know, really specializes that intersection between fashion and sustainability. It's also a particular passion of mine. Um, and I would just like to start with that huge progress has been made in the last decade. So this time, 10 years ago, I was in the midst of a uh, not buying anything new for a year. I was doing swishing for a year and it was felt huge and it was very difficult. Um, and I ran out of shoes and I could, it caused huge problems for me personally in my social life and professionally. And now, 10 years on, it feels like normality. And in fact, I quite often go months, maybe even a year, with unthinkingly not buying anything new. Um, the movement for not buying new is out there. The infrastructure is catching up with Depop um, brand zone platforms. However, I also know firsthand that fashion often struggles to be part of the solution in terms of leaning into climate action, climate justice, um, equality, degrowth. And this isn't just true for fashion. It's true across industries and for many of the other industries that we specialize in at Futera, you know, tech, media entertainment, um, packaged goods and consumer goods. These all share these attributes of having a very heavy footprint and a big spend on marketing or a disproportionate impact on our culture. Um, so both footprint and brain print are important. I hope we're going to explore uh, both of those today. Um, so and final point is if, you know, many of the industry leaders we talk to every day would say we're not there yet. We need better, bigger change at scale, um, wholehearted, big hearted change on the system, recognizing and addressing the systemic racism that we have across all industries, fashion and others, and not just those leaders, consumers are really sure change is needed. Our research on the honest generation and um, honest product found that, you know, uh, there was this disconnect that uh, about, mm, 70 or 80 percent of the experts that we surveyed said that kind of the right level of transparency was being given to consumers this was in partnership with the consumer goods forum and then the inverse was true for consumers about 20 or 30 percent were happy with the level of information that was coming through to them and it's even more compelling for gen z's they're not little millennials purpose and fine words aren't good enough they want to see you put your own house in order so I'm really looking forward to talking to our panel on how we do this, how to dig in and show up in 2022, and how we look at the new frontiers of compliance and consumption. So thanks, Aisha, our marketing and advocacy manager, who's put these questions together and has helped with this whole setup. Um, thank you so much. And um, thank you all the Futurans who've joined. Thank you everyone else who's joined. And thank you, our panelists, for joining. So as a reminder, please, questions as we go to all participants and Cecilia first to you what is the main aim for the green claims code and um, so this is a, a piece of work that we started really to try um, and achieve a couple of different things um, firstly we want to um, use the powers that we have to try and shift um, the the um, the way that businesses are working towards sustainable consumption and to make sure that consumers have the information they need to make those choices. Um, the other thing that we were starting to hear was that some businesses actually who were trying to do good things lack the confidence to, um, to share green information. They were worried about being accused of greenwashing and so they stayed quiet. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we wanted to address that. And then really the last thing is to um, to try and make sure that businesses who are investing more in in telling a story about being in, uh, green than they are in investing in being green are are, um, are subject to to regulatory scrutiny. Great. So thank you, Coalesce, as well. Some of the background to it being created. Um, who needs to take it into account? Anyone specifically in particular? 
I think everybody. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing with them, um, the thing with greenwashing and with environmental claims is really when we started looking at it, the, the claims are being made across every sector of the economy, um, and and even in some places which are quite surprising, um, we're seeing green claims popping up um, in technology, and they're obviously around in fashion and fast-moving consumer goods. Highly polluting industries are are um, making green claims. Um, so really, everybody needs to be having a good look at what they're doing to make sure that they're um, they're they're thinking things through carefully. Um, and I, I ju just to that, I would also add that um, actually, it's not just about businesses at the end of the supply chain. So um, even if you're further up the supply chain and you're you're selling to retailers, you need to be thinking about how you're you're approaching your work because um, businesses are protected to some degree from greenwashing by other businesses. Um, and certainly if your messages are reaching end consumers, um, you're, you're going to be responsible for it. That's great because we often find it's the um, businesses which are consumer facing, which have more of a burning platform, um, but to have this additional pressure um, is interesting. Um, Cecilia, can I also ask you, I know that there's quite an, you know, it's, it's always a wonderful to hear the kind of the story behind behind and I know that there were some personal drivers for creating or leading this piece of work. Would you share those with us as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I've always had a, an interest in the environment, and I, you know, I think back to my days when I first joined the civil service, and I am, um, and I was an, an environmental champion for the department. So it's something that's kind of been around for a long time for me. But actually, the the trigger for this work. Was um, was a couple of years ago. Um, I was going through a period of, of um, uh, poor mental health, and I noticed that there were two things happening. One was that I was getting really frustrated by the amount of stuff I had, and everywhere I looked there was stuff, and it just was really upsetting. And so I set about, I you know, I got into the whole Marie Kondo, let's get rid of everything that doesn't bring me joy. Um, but then I would sit down at the computer in the evening, and especially if I was by myself, if I had had a bad day, if I wasn't feeling right. I was I was browsing online, I was shopping online, and it was really easy to make purchases without even noticing that I was making purchases. Now I'm not I'm not a big fashion shopper, and actually I've always bought a lot of secondhand clothes, but I found even buying stuff I just didn't really need. That I think probably the funniest one was was um, uh, accidentally, as I put it to my husband, um, buying a, a, a vintage nest of tables, coffee table <laughs> from eBay one evening. Um, so I, I started really to think about this interaction between our mental health, and it's, that's an area I'm very interested in, um, the amount of stuff we are acquiring and the impact that that's having on, on the environment. And it was that that kind of led me to, to, you know, coming into the office and saying, we take enforcement action on consumer protection. What can we do um, with the powers that we currently have to try and, and support this journey that the whole planet needs to go on in terms of, of degrowth and, and reducing our consumption? Thank you. Um, and before we dig a little bit more into what's in the code now and which industry is getting prioritised, um, I, I know that after publishing the code, I think you had a period of consultation open where you were asking for where it could go next. Um, and this just feels like a good moment to touch on that. Um, I don't know if you're able to share any of that or if you're in a review process and you, you, things will be shared later, but were there any um, you know, ideas about where and how the code could and should be d developed in terms of consumption or overconsumption or, or anything. So yeah, we, we ran a, a period um, of consultation. We published draft guidance first, and then we opened it up for consultation to find out what people thought of the guidance and what came out of that. We had a lot of comments on the guidance that we had drafted, obviously. Um, but we also had a lot of comments on areas that are, are currently beyond the scope of what we can do. Um, and certainly um, uh, practices that lead to overconsumption was part of that. Um, a lack of, of um, standardized language, so a lack of clear definitions on particularly commonly used terms was something that people were, were pushing us to come up with, but that actually we don't really have the power to, to come up with something that's, that's enforceable. Um, people also touched on issues around um, uh, obsolescence and the fact that um, uh, so many of the products we buy don't last. Um, now, round about the same time that we were publishing the code, we were asked by um, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to provide advice on the interaction between um, uh, competition law, consumer protection law, 
and um, the, the transition to net zero and sustainable development goals. So a lot of what we've learned in that is going into the advice that we're preparing and, and um, that we should be, be publishing um, in the not too distant future. And they're really, um, we've, we've asked people to, to um, talk to us about, and we, we've been thinking about these, these three areas, how we get better quality, um, consistent environmental information. And, and by that, I mean, not just um, the green claims and this is the, these are the good things we're doing, but how do we get the information to consumers about these are the products that are polluting more, or creating more environmental harm. Um, we're, you know, we're touching on, on obsolescence, planned obsolescence. Um, you know, for example, France have attempted to ban planned obsolescence and other jurisdictions have gone down different routes of, of you know, requiring sort of minimum guarantee periods for certain types of products. So we're touching on that. And then um, touching on um, what more could be done in terms of overconsumption. Now, the CMA has done a lot of work, particularly in the on spy, online space, about um, what we, we like to call dark patterns. So these are um, elements of web design or, or business design that cause consumers to um, either rush through a, a purchasing process or are tricked into buying things, you know, subscription traps or the, the classic dark pattern um, but, and, and pressure selling that can lead to, um, uh, you know, lead to people buying more than they actually actually need. So those are things that we can already tackle with consumer protection law, but then we're looking at this question of are there other commercial practices um, that are, are causing people to buy more than they actually than they actually need to? I see Adja wants to come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was wondering how do we how do we tackle all of this? Because I think particularly fast fashion runs off of those systems of um, getting people to buy more urgency purchases where it's like, if you don't get it, you know, it's going to sell out and then you'll be a big loser who doesn't have that dress that you didn't actually need anyways. How do we actually tackle that? Because I do think that without these tactics, people wouldn't be buying 68 garments of clothing a year, basically. If, if there were, if we were tackling it, I just want to know what that looks like in the future. And also, how can I be part of the solution to that? Because as someone who spent my 20s feeling very much trapped by some of these systems, I don't want that for the next generation. I think that that's a huge priority. I think it's really difficult to tackle some of these issues without quite radical um, uh, reform of, of the system and, and, a, and a, a big rethink about what's acceptable. Um, at the moment, consumer protection law is very much focused on protecting consumers' economic interests. Um, and the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and some of the, the guidelines for consumer protection that, that have been um, developed um, since the, the um, Sustainable Development Goal 12 was introduced um, encourage nation states to go away and think about consumer protection not just as a matter of economic protection but actually as a, as a matter of um, or, or as, a, as a, a means of driving sustainable consumption but I, I do think um, that, that quite radical reform is needed um, and there needs to be the political will there to to shift the dial on what is acceptable in terms of, of, of advertising and marketing practices. Go on, Asha. I also have one more follow-up question. Is there also room within this conversation for the very quick popularity of buy now, pay later? Because I have see, I feel like buy now, pay later was something where it was, you know, talked about and now it's everywhere. And there was a really wonderful article about how debt in our society is being made to be aspirational through the popularity of buy now, pay later and the ways in which it's being you know, talked about on social media. Now, I love the idea of payment plans, particularly, you know, making things more accessible to people, but where is that line? Because I do think that very quickly we're seeing a lot of buy now, pay later, you know, programs are crossing that line into pernicious mm -hmm. and not so much about accessibility, but more so get all the things, even if you don't need all the things, or even if you don't want all the things, why not? What's the damage? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I think buy now, pay later is an area that crosses um, crosses the field of several regulators. And I definitely think it's something that needs to be needs to be looked at um, uh, from a debt perspective, but, but you know, from, from a mental health perspective as well, and also from a sustainability perspective. Um, and I think um, I'm right in saying the Advertising Standards Authority has already taken action 
in relation to buy now, pay later. Um, and that was in, in connection with an advert that effectively was encouraging people to, to you know, use buy now, pay later to, to buy stuff to cheer them up. Um, and, and the ASA thought that wasn't a responsible a responsible approach. So, but, it, but you're right, um, Adja, it's, it's really difficult to, to figure out where to draw the line so that you are not um, excluding people for whom buy now, pay later is a, is a lifeline, although I question why we live in a society where we need that lifeline. Um, but, but, you know, it, it is undoubtedly very useful for, for, um, for many people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but at what point does it become a, a, a trigger for overconsumption? I mean, I remember when I was a child um, going to the store that doesn't exist anymore with my mom called Zares, and there was a back section called Layaway. And I and I sort of asked my mother, um, you know, what what is this exactly? What 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 is this thing? What does it? And she basically explained it to me. And you know, the idea of Layaway wasn't as pernicious as some of these programs that I'm seeing now. I love a payment plan, particularly in the field of sustainable fashion, where sometimes the the ticket item, the 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 price mark, sorry, it's my first live back. So I'm trying to get my <laughs> <That is good. laughs> I'm trying to turn my brain off of holiday mode and it yeah. still is it still is there. So I understand that with sustainability sometimes the the price tag of garments is a bit higher than what people are used to because of the popularity of super fast fashion and so i like the idea of making things more accessible but i guess i just don't know where the line is because i do think once you start encouraging people to buy things to cheer themselves up whether or not you know they actually need it that's where maybe you know so yes i think yeah and if I may, on the um, earlier point around um, uh, the, kind of the role of communications in driving over consumption, I, I feel change is coming. You know, the um, look into fashion for a moment, the new uh, charter, fashion charter for the UN um, for the first time put in not just a, um, upgraded footprint targets, but for the first time, a commitment to align all messages with a 1.5 degree lifestyle. Now, obviously we are so far from that at the moment, but the fact that this is now starting to make it into, you know, UNF, C documents, um, there's a way to go. If you look at as well, the work that uh, we've been doing at Futera around agencies disclosing um, where who pays their bills basically, and thinking about the um, uh, emissions of influence, as my colleague Solitaire uh, coins it, um, that I think we can start to see that this responsibility for all of your footprint, your brain print and your footprint is coming, um, is really coming. Um, now, on that, Cecilia, yeah, I think uh, over the weekend or on Friday, the CMA um, announced that you'll be prioritising the fashion industry in your upcoming compliance review. Could you discuss why and why this industry and perhaps, you know, who's coming next? That type of thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, fashion was an area where throughout our programme of work, so right from from November 2020, when we first asked people where we thought the issues lay with, with environmental claims um, through our guidance um, uh, development and consultation process, um, people were telling us that there were there were issues with, with greenwash in fashion. And fashion is, is an enormous sector. I mean, if you think, if you look at the, at the figures, there's about 54 billion pounds a year spent by UK consumers alone um, on, on uh, fashion retail. Or in fashion fashion items um, and and it's quite difficult to get a, a firm figure on what the kind of global contribution is but estimates anywhere between two and about eight percent um, of of, uh, um, of global emissions coming from from the fashion sector um, so it felt like an area where we could um, really make quite a big difference for for consumers um, quite quickly um, there are, as I said, problems with greenwash across um, lots of different sectors, and we have we've really been thinking carefully about which sectors to to prioritise. Um, I, I mean, I think it's you know it's likely that um, fast-moving consumer goods, so things like personal care and and then um, uh, household items, are something that will be on our our list further further down the line. Um, but we're we're also sort of very open to um, you know to hearing from people about what other areas we should 
um, we should tackle. We also, when we're considering what we're going to be looking at next, we're, we think about who else is looking at at, um, at issues. So we know, um, for example, a lot of people are concerned about marketing of energy tariffs, but actually mm -hmm. there's work going on in government and with the, the energy mm -hmm. regulator to, to try and come up with a better way of conveying that information. Um, air travel, the Civil Aviation Authority, they're looking at how they could standardise information to consumers. Fashion is an area that's obviously not regulated, and so it was one where I say, we felt we could really um, make, a, make a difference quickly. Great. And I mean, Azure's already uh, flagged some of them, the, kind of the, you know, the buy now, pay later. There's been some great questions coming in, so thanks everyone. We'll go there for a moment, and then Azure, I'm going to come to you um, about uh, will there be anything to, on fashion, address the uh, nightmare of free returns? And wider, across all industries, could we ever imagine greenwash legislation encompassing the buy one, get one free um, piece? So I think that goes, both of those things go back to, to what I was saying about um, the need for, for a decision, a shift in where the line is drawn between what's acceptable and what's what's not, because clearly um, there, are, um, there are cases where free returns are encouraging people to buy more than they need and then return it, which, you know, that, that process in and of itself is, is obviously um, challenging, creating, creating issues for um, uh, carbon consumption and buy one get one free can lead to, to overconsumption. Um, but actually there's there's sort of mixed evidence on some of these practices because clearly um, some people are um, benefiting if they you know if they're if they're buying one and getting one free, they are actually genuinely benefiting from the from the advantages that that not having to pay for two or pay for two brings them. Um, so it's it's um it's challenging to try and make sure that we're not creating um unfairness or economic harm for, for particular particularly vulnerable groups of consumers by banning some of these practices but equally we need to take into account the fact that um, that you know they are prone to causing overconsumption in other yeah. cases yeah like um, and again that's similar to Azure's point about the kind of Klarna and actually um, helping pay for the premium which um, again has been picked up in the chat um, okay one more question and then Azure will go to you because there's just a very specific one on what happens if the code is breached or more specifically when and how the CMA audit brand compliance with green claims codes and then Jenny and Vicky will come to your questions with Azure in a moment um and is it is it you know the asa kind of relies on almost um voluntary submissions like people need to flag it to the asa is that going to be the same with the cma or do you have a different process so for the fashion review we are we are proactively going out and looking um at, at what fashion um, retailers are doing um we will be working first of all on a sweep so that's where we go and basically look at everybody's websites um, to see what they're up to, to see what's being sold, to see what messages are being delivered. Um, we'll also do um, desk-based research. We'll look at um, consumer complaints. So we're, we're encouraging people to tell us if they've spotted something they don't like. We talk to other regulators, not just in the UK, but actually also in, in, um, in the EU. And um, we talk with the Advertising Standards Authority so we know what complaints are coming in to them about, about the fashion industry. Um, and then we, we have power to um, request information from businesses. So um, once we're a bit further down the line and we've, we've um, narrowed our focus slightly, we'll be able to ask, um, ask businesses to provide us with information. And that might be information about you know, uh, um, how they're using the messages, what evidence they have to substantiate the messages, mm -hmm. um, what um, research they've done on about how consumers understand the messages. So we'll be doing, we'll be doing all of that. Um, we have a, a um, it's it's not quite the same as the ASA system, but we we do have a a, um, a system of voluntary undertakings. So, um, if we approach a business that we think is is doing something wrong, um, and and we can agree with them a set of changes that they will make, um, then we'll we'll accept undertakings from them um, without having to. Um, to take any sort of harder enforcement. But if we don't get those undertakings, then a business can end up um, being taken to court um, right. and can have a, a court order imposed to try and um, uh, force them to make to make those changes. And it can be a whole raft of different things. So obviously stopping using the messages um, is one thing, but actually requiring them to, to revisit their um, compliance systems in-house and um, training staff. Uh, you know, you mentioned the kind of the challenges of um, of staff not understanding um, sustainability, so we can you know we could look at 
training staff. We can ask them to put out information to their customers so that they're correcting any disinformation. Um, and in some cases, we can even um, require them to pay redress to consumers who've, who've lost out financially as a result of, uh, of mis-selling. Okay, so you would like um, a, a c consumers to let you know as well. And to this, uh, on the CMA, Twitter or... Um, online or what's the best yeah way? i mean you can come through us you can come through our, our um uh, social media or um, we have a, a misleading green claims at cma.gov.uk email address that you can contact right. us on as well so i'm sure we can share that after the webinar okay great Azure. um over to you and again cecilia if you've got questions for Azure, please do ask them as well um and so much of this conversation has already been, you know, green, greenwash and green claims or eradicating greenwash and making proper and truthful green claims are such a, a lever that we've got for sustainable lifestyles. Um, but your work obviously leans into that so much. There's been so many questions on this already. Um, so can you tell us, you know, a bit, always describe your role in, in encouraging sustainable lifestyles or, you know, what the, the, the journey behind your work as well? Yeah, so um, I am someone who has an Instagram platform and the minute my platform started to grow, I began to look around and realize the majority of the ways of monetizing online platforms was through selling products that I did not feel comfortable selling to people. And then I began to really realize that a lot of times when I had made certain purchases, particularly with the rise of social media in the last 15 years that had often been spurred on by social media. And so I was already in a space where I was trying to sort of get people to think about buying better, buying differently. But then I began to realize that um, actually this space of Instagram needs really clear cut sustainability information that isn't clouded by a veil of advertising and you can't be as honest as you'd like to be on Instagram about who some of the worst culprits are if you were then depending on other brands to pay you money to continue to do that it just doesn't work that way so I made a pledge to my readership that I would never take a dollar from fast fashion to have this platform where we talk about sustainability, honestly, but I also do not encourage, you know, unchecked consumption because, you know, I think that's a part of the problem is that we can talk about sustainability as much as we want, but if we're encouraging people, you know, on our platforms to buy new things every day, to wear new things every time you're on Instagram, then you are actually participating in that very system that is aiding in detriment to the planet and the environment. And so I've had to take gambles in my career because all I could think when I was like, I can't take any money from the system was I am going to be broke for the rest of my life. But <laughs> uh, as it turned out, people thought that there was a great deal of value in having a space where you knew that the information that you were getting wasn't tainted by, you know, the appeal of wanting a paycheck. And I think one of the big problems that I see with the fashion industry in general is that I think people are scared. I think most people really do understand who the worst culprits are, what needs to change, but we are in a world where everyone has to pay their bills. You have to eat, you have to keep your lights on. You know, I see the people that sign up to my Patreon and some of them work for brands that I drag regularly. And it's because I know that that change is there, but perhaps that person feels like if they're the squeaky wheel, who's basically like, hey, we have to stop doing things that we know pollutes the environment, then like, it's very easy to get rid of the squeaky wheel. Right. And everyone is always worried about where their next paycheck is coming from, which is a legit concern. I completely understand that. And so by being the person who, you know, doesn't have attachment to that because my work is mostly supported through Patreon and most recently my book, I am just able to be like, right, that's bullshit right there. And I think that is what needs to be said more often because um, the fashion and beauty and consumer goods industry is very like, oh, this is great. This is great. Everything's great. Not everything is great. It turns out that these industries are 
responsible for a lot of pollution on our planet. Um, the, the idea that social media is tied to the rise of fast fashion is clearly there for me. And uh, when we think about social media and popularity and the impact that it has on young people, there was a New York Times article a few years ago, it was a profile where it talked about how the average, it was like, what do Gen Z shoppers want a cheap outfit to wear on Friday night? And one of the, um, one of the points that was made is that the average Gen Z shopper does not feel comfortable wearing the same outfit twice on social media. Mm -hmm. That is a bad thing. This is impacting the young people. You know, we, we say, oh, well, why, you know, you hear Molly May say, when did it become normal for people to wear things just once, which is a disingenuous statement for her to make. She knows as a person who is paid to not repeat outfits, to make her young following want the things that she is wearing, that it is normalized to the very actions that you participate in that make you a very wealthy person. So like, there's a lot of dishonesty and there's a lot of obscuring of facts and figures and I'm never going to do that. And it's a pretty awesome position to be in, you know, and it's great because the community continues to grow. People mm -hmm. continue to push back from, you know, exploitative brands and that pushback that happens online is important. People can say, keyboard warriors all they want, but when a brand miscommunicates the findings of something like of the fashion rev transparency index, right. it is important for there to be pushback. Without pushback, that brand never apologizes, which did end up happening. So I do see cause and effect from these community spaces where people are getting educated, but we definitely need government regulation because it's I feel like every time my readership grows and a new crop of people come in, it's like reinventing the wheel again. We have to go back to the beginning and explain to people where the problems are. There's a lot of miscommunication where people don't understand how scale plays into it all. If everyone is holding all designers and all brands to the same standards as the high street heavies, that is so unfair. But the average person doesn't understand the difference between a brand that wastes, you know, a hundred million garments a year and a brand that doesn't even make a hundred million garments a year. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I serve to sort of debunk that on my platform. And I also talk about racism and yeah. colonialism, which ties in with this, because when we look at our consumer goods, when we look at who is making our garments, when we look at who's land is being polluted by the processes that go into clothing production. It's non-white countries in the global South who coincide, who coincidentally are also seeing the impact of climate crisis before countries in the global North are. So it's like a double whammy here. And then additionally, because we are producing so much clothing to the tune of, I think, 100 billion garments a year. And we're clearly not wearing all of that because the rate at which fast fashion moves means that you are constantly having to clean out your wardrobe. We're creating ecological crisis also in countries in the global south. So you see this in Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and most recently in Chile in the Atacama Desert. You know, so this is a problem that is deeply tied to colonialism and racism and systems which have been in place for hundreds of years. I mean, we've seen fast fashion amp up in the last like 20 years, but the system of exploitation of resources and labor is as old as America. All right. Um, that was one of the things I really wanted to put out. So I think I was just, I'm just going to, for anyone who is late joining, I'm just going to flash the back up again. <laughs> <laughs> I was making, I made a joke before we went live that my publisher is like, you need to mention the book. And I'm like, but I don't sell things. <laughs> don't worry, we'll, we'll do that bit. Um, but what I really liked um, in reading the book and on your platform is how you use um, your platform, but also humor to slowly peel away layer by layer some of the systemic issues that we have going on, which I think is, is very powerful. 
Um, and I wondered, um, so you've started pinning them a little bit away uh, in um, the conversation just now. I wondered if we could take it for a moment to consumers, which we, we touched upon, but it, is there this moment where, when you kind of educate folks and then they feel that these negative impacts of overconsumption are so out of their control um, that they feel overwhelmed? And I wondered if you had any, you know, specifically for consumers now, you know, tips, you know, us, yeah. On how you can take action to push the change. The first thing I tell people is that if you feel overwhelmed, just stop buying. Um, we buy so much clothing, we buy so much stuff, we buy everything. If we get a new pet, we want all the accessories. If we get a new sport on, we want all the different things. We have to slow down. And I think the only way in which you can find peace and clarity, particularly if you are the person who is buying 68 garments of clothing a year and above is to slow that cycle down. I had to do that for myself. And the thing about my platform is that I never try and sit from a place of judgment where I'm just like, I do this and I do that. And I am so much more sustainable. One, because that is not true. I bought a bunch of fast fashion in my 20s. And two, no one likes that person. So I try and really keep it real with people. But I think we have to be real and honest with ourselves and the damage that we are doing. Are you the person that buys new garments every single season, even though you know that the things that you have from the previous season are still perfectly fine? If you're that person, then you have some changes to make. Um, because one thing I found was I was that person. And I was also the person that would say, I don't have enough money to buy better brands. I can't afford the, the brand that might cost just a little bit more because oftentimes, particularly with sustainable fashion, as it becomes more abundant, the price tag is actually not that much higher than a lot of the high street stuff that you're going to see, particularly the upmarket high street stuff. And so I ask people to visualize where you are in that system, because at the time when I was still participating in fast fashion, I was often telling myself like, oh, I, I can't really afford that. And what I found was that was actually untrue. I was spending so much money on fast fashion, but the reality was a lot of the stuff that I was buying wasn't staying in my wardrobe for more than, you know, a couple of years. Um, and additionally, now I find obviously my position in life has changed, but even before I got to a place where I was writing books, I found that I could actually afford that one nice dress if I didn't buy five dresses I didn't need last month, which that's a reality that we have to face because the world tells us that this abundance is our right. And I think part of the reason why we get in this position personally for my generation is fast fashion might sometimes feel like the only thing that we have control over. We are in a world which is clearly heating up because of climate crisis. I have, you know, I graduated school to be spat out into a terrible job market, recession after recession. How many recessions does one person have to live through? Most people my age can't afford to buy houses. So I completely understand the pull of a system like fast fashion. I get it. We are, we feel like we can't change these systems so instead, change your outfit. But that's not the solution either. And so um, the goal is to always meet people where they're at, but get us to think critically and honestly about the positioning that we play in the system. If you're the person that only buys four garments a year and you have to get them from Shein, you're not the one who's making this mess, you know? <laughs> All right. Um, there's a question about the system and employees and how they can create change, which I'd, I'd love to come to both of you on in a moment, um, because first there's been a, a bit of a slew of questions around, um, again, this kind of green price premium um, and, uh, and, you know, whether there should be um, a plan to subsidise green fashion brands or stop unethical brands from reducing prices so substantially, for example. And I just wanted to link that to um, uh, I know that you spoke in an interview with Asad Raymond on the importance of regulating fast fashion. So just digging into fast fashion for a moment in the same way cigarettes are. And I just wanted to ask you to explore that a little bit and how yeah. you could see that happening. And um, Cecilia, that might not be quite your uh, 
area, but if there's anything you want to add into that, please do as well. I think the sooner everyone has to play in the same playing field, and right now that's not true. You have brands that, you know, many of the sustainable fashion brands that I know, and I know a few of them, a lot of times the founder has months where they can't take a paycheck for themselves because they are doing things the right way. And it's not necessarily a world where it's affordable to do that. And when we make it so that everyone has to play on the same playing field and by the same rules, it means that the smaller brands who struggle month to month to pay everyone fairly are now having to, you know, are, are now being highlighted for doing that. And I feel like there's so many loopholes for a big brand to say, oh yes, we, we did this t-shirt out of sustainable cotton. Everyone call it sustainable. Meanwhile, you have small brands that are living wage employers and they have to justify why they charge what they charge to a consumer who has been brought up to believe that fast fashion brands and fast fashion pricing doesn't have exploitation built into its very bones. And so regulation is so important because small brands can't survive if we don't regulate. I think having a, you know, nothing good thrives in a world where we have businesses that are just huge monopolies. And currently I think it's something like 90% of fashion profits go to like basically like the same 50 brands and like, that's horrible. And so for me, we need regulation because I see brands that are doing good work. They're doing everything by the book, but as long as people don't have to play by the same rules, these brands will not survive. These businesses will not survive. And I think there is room for there to be incentives within the government to make it easier for the brands that are doing things the right way to get certain tax breaks and whatnot. And those tax breaks could come at the expense of taxing polluters. <laughs> I, I think that's a really interesting point, Adja. I mean, I think one of the things, and this is not official CMA policy, it's just something that I've been thinking about, <laughs> is the fact that so, so much of of, um, of what's produced cheaply and sold cheaply is done so because it's not pricing in the negative externalities. It's it's you know it, it's done because there's there's cheap labour because they are not following best practice and they're polluting rivers or. Um, uh, you know, or, or causing pollution by shipping stuff all over the world, never mind um, not paying for what happens to goods at the end of their life. Um, and I, I do think more broadly that we, we do probably need something that um, forces pricing down a, a route that um, that means that people are, are see the actual cost of, of a product and not just the, the kind of the cost um, of, of a very narrow band of what that that product is actually doing um, in terms of environmental impact. So um, I, there has I to be an incentive. That. There just has to be an incentive to do the right thing. And I feel like right now the incentive isn't really there. And I feel like a lot of these brands only kind of respond to numerical amounts with pound signs. And so making it worth their while to see that their competitor is getting something out of the deal that they're not. It's sad that that's how it has to be. People should just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. But realistically speaking, I would love to see incentives for businesses and, you know, easier small business loans, that sort of thing. I really think that the independent small business is pushing the sustainability conversation where it needs to be and they need to be rewarded for that so that they can survive. For a lot of independent brands, the lifespan is five years or less. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really quite tragic that we live in a society where if you don't end up selling parts of your business or you know, doing something to make sure that you're funded, you can't survive. So how do we make it so that it's, you know, a thing where you can survive and sustain yourself while also doing the right thing. Um, there was a, sticking with fashion, there was an interesting call out from textile exchange, again, around COP, around um, pricing incentives for environmentally preferred materials. So to do, to try and do exactly that, to, um, uh, to subsidize through tariffs and tax breaks, those 
materials that don't have all of those terrible environmental externalities and social inequities um, within them. Um, wider than fashion for a moment, Cecilia, there is a question in the chat specifically on um, the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the UK, because just picking up there on what Azure is saying around, you know, as well as crowding in good, basically, which is the chair is most comfortable in, but looking at crowding out bad, um, there's a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the UK that can hold British nationals and UK registered businesses to account for bribery outside of the UK. And do we need the same for greenwash? Um, the UK and USA are both powerhouses of advertising and should the UK regulator hold both of these agencies and clients, both agencies and clients to account for egregious acts of greenwash? If you, if you wouldn't mind touching on that, and I would love to tack on my own, which is I know you touched a bit on some of the work that's being done by your international um, you know, peers, but if you could tell us as well about some of the work, because we have a lot of international folks on the call, some of the work that's being done by the um, CMA-like agencies in, in different countries. Yeah, so just um, on the, the first question about um, uh, holding um, businesses to account for, for damage done elsewhere, I mean, both, both the... Um, UK consumer protection framework and indeed the US consumer protection framework allow um, our agencies to take action against businesses in the UK who are causing harm to consumers outside of the UK. And now, of course, we've always got to prioritise a lot of a lot of it will come down to what our priorities are. But um, it's certainly um, something that we that we can and, and do look at. Um, I think more widely, um, and again, this is something that we'll touch on in the, um, in the sustainability advice, is that there's a big push to try and force some degree of supply chain transparency, which we, we heard a lot from, from retailers and particularly from small businesses about how difficult it was to actually get the supply chain information that they, they need so that they can see across the whole um, supply chain that, they're, that you know, the things are going, going well um, and, and uh, you know, having in place something that's perhaps not dissimilar to um, uh, the, the um, modern slavery provisions. Right. Um, and there have been attempts in um, Germany and then quite recently in New York um, to, to try and force that, that supply chain transparency um, uh, and bring it to, to an environmental space. Now, of course, we're all just trying these things out now and there's a question of how successful any of these things are going to be. But, you know, I think that's, that's um, something that's important. Um, in terms of the work that we're doing with other people and the work that other people are doing, I think um, misleading um, environmental claims and sustainability issues are, are a priority for um, a large number of consumer protection authorities around the world. Um, and in the last couple of years, we have seen um, New Zealand bring out new guidelines. We have seen guidelines come out of Denmark, um, of the net from the Netherlands. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, I believe they're due, they, they've had um, a green um, green guide for um, a number of years now, but they're due to review it in 2022. Um, we're seeing um, countries in the Global South, for example, um, also bringing out guidance and, and uh, Costa Rica and, and Mexico have both, both done a lot of work in this space. The Colombians are engaging with the, the UN to develop you know, a glossary of, of terminology that we can all agree on. So. There's a huge amount of work going on in the individual authorities, but then we're also trying to work together to, to make sure that, that um, there's, there's no hiding place really and that, that um, businesses that are operating internationally um, can't, um, can't cherry pick their jurisdiction and that they'll be held to the same standards um, regardless of where they're selling or regardless of where they're based. Right. Um... Well, absolutely right. International trade requires international laws. Um, so... Uh, I'm, we've got five minutes to go, and I'm going to do a preemptive thank you to the panellists for being so wonderful, but I'm going to keep it quite short, so can you please appreciate a huge amount of thanks in a very short <laughs> space of time, and let's see if we can just motor through, as you predicted this would happen, motor through the, rest, you. <laughs> the rest of the questions. Yeah, and I'm before, going to we, before we go to the end of the yes. questions, can I ask Cecilia, how can we get the general public um, talking more about what you're doing and get people because people tell me about their where can I send people people tell me about their their gripes with brands all the time that's what I do online I'm a listening ear and I would love to be like you know where you put that complaint here you go and I think you know if there's a place where I can send it if it's the email address that's fine but if there's a more official way of registering things 
making that really clear to people. I'm happy to, I'll make an Instagram post and be like, do you see something that a brand is doing that doesn't sit right with you, you know? Yeah, that, that's great. So, I mean, I'd say the email address is, is probably the easiest one because that comes direct to my team and we, you know, we can sift through the information mm-hmm. we're being sent. So that's, um, again, misleading uh, green claims at cma.gov.uk. Okay. Um, post anything on, we have we have Facebook, we have Twitter, um, we have LinkedIn. Um, I think we might have Instagram, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm not very good with social media. <laughs> um, but, we, you know, we have a number of channels that people can also come come to us Um about that um there's the the usual complaints processes as well if you go to the advertising standards authority with a complaint and we work very closely with them so if they know we're interested in something they will bring that to our attention as well um so yeah lots of different ways that you can contact us and let us know what's what you're seeing thank you wonderful um looking forward to seeing that instagram post <laughs> and now in time order we'll just maybe through a couple more and actually there's a couple of uh, in the actual q a piece there's a couple of um, anonymous questions okay around worst examples of green martial ethics wash you've ever seen and as cecilia feel free to answer that and Azure, is it ever possible for a fast fashion brand to undertake any marketing which isn't by default green wash Yeah, so I'll start with that one. First and foremost, the entire model of fast fashion is inherently unsustainable. That's the thing. Nobody wants to be like, yeah, maybe we just shouldn't make 50 seasons of clothing a year. Nobody wants to say that. It's the pinkest elephant in the room. You cannot push that amount of clothing on human beings and then go, oh, but we have a sustainable line. Who cares? Nobody needs 68 items of clothing a year. That's the problem. And then to answer the other question, the scale will always be the issue. And one of the things that you notice, particularly like Fashion Revolution's Transparency Index, is that there's always a note about how brands are very, very tricky about disclosing the volume of business Mm -hmm. that they're doing, the volume of waste they are creating. And that is where I see the largest problem. It's like, if we aren't making people disclose these things, then they can say that it's not really happening or no, we didn't waste a hundred thousand garments in one go because of some sort of thing that went wrong. That's an issue. The thing is with a small brand, I mean, I use Laura Jean as an example. I collaborate with Laura, full disclosure. We don't have the money to waste a hundred thousand of anything and we never will. You know what I mean? So I think the big brands have the most amount of work to do. And there's a good phrase for this, that it's, it's easier to change the direction of a speedboat than like an ocean liner. And that's where I think the problems are. But I think the entire model of fast fashion can truly never be sustainable because if it were sustainable, it wouldn't be fast. Um, and then did I answer both of those questions? I tried to. Um, Cecilia, did you, I, I guess you can't, you're not allowed to say which the worst cases are that you've seen. <laughs> Sadly um, not. <laughs> I, th- I think any brand that runs on a business model where you're doing, you know, tons of seasons of clothing a year needs to probably keep sustainability out of their mouth. You know what I mean? Like change your practice, make fewer items, make better items, pay people more, push less on the consumer. And then we'll talk, but that's the one pink elephant that no one's really trying to address because there's just so much money in pushing people to make purchases they don't have to make. So much money, billions of dollars. That's the entrance criteria now. (laughs) Exactly. Um, We are at time. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all the questions. There was there was one more question. Can I can I do someone asked me about if I have success with like someone said success? Absolutely. I just want to say like every week I get a message from someone that says, when I first came upon your platform, I was like, I'm never changing. I like fast fashion. And then they're like, I start to read more. I start to feel more uncomfortable Then I think I'll take a year. I'll take like a few weeks off. And then before you know it, a few weeks have turned into six months and I'm looking at my bank account as I'm realizing I suddenly have more in savings than I used to have. And now I'm really uncomfortable the last 10 years. I get those messages at least once a week. So yes, there is impact there. People do realize that we don't have to actually participate in this system. Like every now and then you're going to have to get the pants from, you're going to have to get the underpants from the store that isn't the most sustainable, but you don't need to get two summer dresses while you're there and a pair of jeans, especially when you already have these things in your wardrobe. Right, right, right. So yes, we have success rates. 
And just ever so quickly on employees, because I'm sorry that question's been there for a little while, um, I would just jump in and say magic logic <laughs> without wanting to do too much of a terror sales job, but it's what we've heard, found has worked over the years. So um, advocate for change on a level on the stuff that counts, the stuff that will really you know, shift the dial, but set it, give it the creative, give it the magic, give it the guts and glory, give it the heart. And, and be one, brave, be yeah, brave yeah. and form community within your work, which is hard because I know that sometimes workspaces can be really competitive, but right. try and form community and find your allies and be brave there. Right. Because whenever we, you know, talk about a big brand who's really messing up online, there have been so many conversations that have happened behind the scenes before we go forward with what we're seeing. And so be brave, form communities within the spaces you're in and those people will show up to support what you're doing and hopefully you'll have more safety in numbers. Right. And we see that with those open letters to the tech companies, you know, a lot. Okay, thank you. I so want to keep going. Can we do another one next month, please? I would, I would <laughs> love to do this again. I knew it would go quickly. I told you it would. <laughs> thank you, Aja. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, everyone, for all your questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them, but look out for the next round of webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.